Hello, Buzzkillers. It's a new year. It's a great new year. And this January is particularly wonderful for me because it has it it has the appearance of a very, very important book called Myth America, which is frankly, the most important book related to this show, I think, ever published. And we're very, very fortunate, you're very, very fortunate, especially, that we have on the line the two editors of this new book, Dr. Kevin Cruz and Dr. Julian Zelizer, on the line over the internet to talk to us about it. Dr. Cruz, thanks so much for coming on the show. A pleasure to be here. Dr. Zelizer, thanks for coming back on the show. You've been on before. Thank you. It's great to be back with you. We need to have a shout out to one of our Patreon members and strongest supporters, Bill Penhaligon, who has helped bring these shows to all you folks. So thanks, Bill. And we'll be shouting out Patreon supporters all this year. Professors, I want the answer to the question I'm about to pose to be this, that you wrote the book, you came up with the idea for the book, you got all the contributors for the book, just so it could help the Professor Buzzkill History Podcast. But I have a strong, <laughs> strong feeling that that may not be the full story. So, Dr. Cruz, will you tell us, first of all, why were you prompted to write it now? Well, it is it is for you, but it's for yeah, other people like you. So we really wrote this as a way to kind of bridge the gap between what historians do when we get deep in the weeds and the things we talk about among ourselves and debates and disagreements in the general public. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of this come through where historians have been doing those sorts of things in recent years, which is on Twitter. And each of us have been, uh, not just Julian and me, but the other 18 contributors we have, have been busy on Twitter pushing back against certain falsehoods and uh, misconceptions and, and outright lies about the American past. And we realized that we were kind of in a collective project. And what better way for historians than to speak to that collective project than an edited collection? So that's what led us to the book. Well, we're recording this show in mid-December, and it's coming out in early January to coincide with the publication of the book, the release of the book. And we certainly hope that Twitter is still alive <laughs> in early January 2023. Right. I mean, it seems to be going through some really shocking transformations now. But Dr. Zelizer, why did you want to address history myths so directly and publicly? This book, apart from the slavery thing, which we'll talk about in a minute, really goes after some of the biggies. I'd say, look, there are a lot of things that go into making a book and, and how these projects come together. And I think Kevin talks about one that was important. There are just a lot of historians out there who are doing what is called public facing work, a lot of it on social media, Twitter and other platforms. And we thought, hey, why not have a book where we have these authors do what they've been doing, taking on the issues that really matter to them, but having a little more of an expanded format where they could really dig in, they could bring to the table a lot of their knowledge about an issue, uh, and then show show the public what's behind you know, a tweet uh, or what's behind a statement you hear on air. And I'd say just stepping back, in my mind, there's kind of three things that were really at work. One was just Kevin and I seeing in the public square, in the public sphere, how much disinformation, how much stuff that just wasn't true based on what anyone in a history class would be learning uh, that is now circulating as fact and pseudo history by writers who aren't really connected to what people are researching and people who read kind of endlessly on a subject understand. And we wanted to correct this. I mean, we wanted to have at least one work that says, hey, for example, when everyone says, well, government's never worked, it's a constant failure, New Deal, Great Society, look at that, which you hear all the time, doesn't really match what historians have found about the impact that government has had, whether you like it or not. The idea that the New Deal was a total failure just doesn't really square with the evidence. Second, a lot of the debate these days is about history in the classroom. And a lot of it has fallen under the rubric of critical race theory and, and what students are learning in their textbooks. And often, I mean, I think Kevin and I are on the same page. There's debates about things that are pretty standard mm -hmm. uh, for many historians. So, you know, take the impact of race on institutions. This is not new. It's something many generations of historians have been uncovering and finding in their research. But yet it's treated as some sort of anomaly when you hear about this or an oddity, a radical agenda. And, uh, and that isn't the case. And so we wanted historians to showcase. And finally, just a good book. I mean, part of what we wanted to do is bring really good historians who write well, 
who can synthesize issues in a compelling fashion who are in public and just have a, a good history book for people who like history to read about all kinds of topics. And that was as much, I think, in some ways behind this as the other more pointed accomplishments or objectives that we had. Well, it is a, just an absolutely tremendous book and we want all the buzz killers to get it. Why do you think the last few years we've seen such a rise in not only the number of these public facing historians, as you call them, but in ter but terms of the quality? I mean, what Professor Richardson is putting out on, on a daily basis in her Letters for America, what you folks are doing on, on social media is just asta astounding. It's astounding. It's one of the reasons I left academia and went into public history in this way, in this uh, fashion. Is it mainly because of social media that there are now avenues for it? Or is it because the misinformation and the miss the myths about history are so much stronger now and promoted so much more strongly? Dr. Cruz. Well, you know, well, we're a historian, so the answer is always going to be to any question. It's a little of both, right? And so uh, I do think we've seen a real uptick in the disinformation of the public sphere, which has certainly prompted historians to push back against that. I think the disinformation would exist without social media. We've got a number of, you know, Dinesh D'Souza documentaries or Fox News or a talk radio is certainly spreading a lot of these things. Social media certainly helped amplify them, but I think social media has actually worked most in the other direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, historians don't have a Fox News or a talk radio or certainly, you know, the, the kind of documentary reach that we all wish we might have, but social media has let all of us plug in and push back. And so uh, I think that's really been something remarkable, uh, not just on Twitter, but on Facebook and Substack and, and other places like that, that we've really got the power at our fingertips. It's really in one good sense, democratized the public sphere and let historians engage uh, we'd always been engaged before, but it used to be a slower process. You know, Julian's got the ability to go on air and CNN. Not many of us have that. And, and instead, it would simply be, you know, we've got to write an op-ed for a newspaper. And that's a process that takes several days, a lot of vetting. It's not immediate. And it doesn't necessarily have the, the reach. Where social media is immediate, it's broad, you can immediately push back on things even before they kind of cement in the public dialogue. And that's really important. So I think that has really encouraged a lot of people, especially our contributors, to get involved and get engaged even more than they already were. Well, I think that what I've seen on social media in the last five, six, seven years, whatever it's been in these terms, has been absolutely fantastic. I'm an American who, as a graduate student and then as an academic, I didn't do American history, I did British history. I'm learning an awful lot more about American history that I didn't know before that I don't think I would know know if I hadn't been following all of these Americanists on social media. But let me, let's get into this. One of the first things you mentioned so that's so fascinating in the introduction to the book is the development of the history wars. Now, the history wars, I tend to think of as something relatively new, or lots of, lots of people tend to think of it as something relatively new, the 1619 Project and things like that. But you're able to show, as almost all the chapters in the book show, it goes back further than that. And there's, there's a whole lot more to the history wars than we previously thought. Professor Zelizer, why did the history wars start? Well, first of all, let's tell the bus killers when they started, and then why do you think they started? Well, I mean, really, the history wars have always been with us. One way to think of the history wars is not public debates over one particular question or about an exhibit. It's what we call historiography. Mm -hmm. I mean, history discipline is literally built around two things. One is the research we do in the archives, but B are this kind of this ongoing debate you have where you keep challenging, questioning, uh, sometimes supporting previous generations of historians. So on an issue like Reconstruction, for example, there never has not been a period of history wars. I mean, generations have been going over and reinterpreting and saying why others had it wrong on the nature of Reconstruction, what it accomplished, what it failed, why it failed, the implications for American life. We, we can go on and on about how many times this has happened. There are debates about the Cold War and the origins of the Cold War was for a while a, a kind of really robust history war, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it was taking place in the academy, and it was good. We wanted this. We wanted these kind of debates. Then you have uh, public debates, history war stuff. A lot of it has been taking place since the 1990s, where in the public sphere, there's more debates about particular issues. There was a famous exhibit on the Enola Gay that the Smithsonian was putting on to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the bomb. And it blew up into a huge, really 
again, debate, war, whatever word you want to use about how we think. We should remind the buzzkillers that the Enola Gay was the airplane, the name of the airplane that delivered, I think, at least one of the bombs, the first yes. one. And then there was a debate about what Atomic was in bombs. the exhibit, what wasn't in the exhibit, where you had curators debating with historians and, and, and so on. Uh, that was this controversy that blew up. And in the 90s, there were a couple examples of this that really unfold. And, and since then, again, in terms of the public sphere kind of history wars, there's been many. There are history standards that were promoted for a while that became very contentious. And I guess, you know, there's just tons of examples. that And, there were, and there's also myth-busting books that have been out there, which themselves become a source of debate. One of the famous ones was Howard Zinn who wrote a book, The People's History of the U.S., which was really challenging main narrative about kind of what happened in this country and why do we look at presidents and leaders rather than uh, the people who were on the other side of, of the debate. And his book became debated. So the history wars are literally what the history profession does, sometimes in public, sometimes not. And when it's done well, it's actually a productive thing. It's a debate, a conversation rather than a war. But Dr. Cruz, one of the things I, I think that's happened in the, in the last 30 years is the history wars, a lot of the history wars, which I agree, I agree completely are, are very, very important and are a good thing in many ways. The history wars haven't been done well. There's an awful lot of reactionary things. There's an awful lot of stuff based on no evidence. It's just, just based on pure fable. Why do you think that has se seemed to become so strong in this most recent iteration of the 90s? in the for 21st century history war. Yeah, I think that's an astute observation. I, I do think things have changed since the 90s. As Julian described it, described it well, these earlier phases of the history wars where, where the usual kind of internal disagreements and the healthy discussions that we have as historians spilled out into the public. And it's just it's just not that the public is ignorant, but they, they somehow don't understand how historians work, right? You can see this in the, the the characterization of some history as revisionist, and that's necessarily bad. Well, all history is revisionist. Mm -hmm. If you do it right, you're getting new evidence, you're getting new uh, new perspectives, you're getting new material, and you're revising your assumptions, right? You're getting to a more perfect understanding of the past. Uh, in the public, that's usually dismissed as bad. That somehow there was a, one right vision of history, and it's always been this way, and anything that challenges it is somehow wrong, and it un misunderstands the process. So in the 90s, it was kind of that collision between professional historians and a public that just didn't quite understand what we were doing. Today, it's rather different in that it's not professional historians encountering a kind of indifferent public. We're encountering and pushing back on a set of partisan actors who have taken it upon themselves mm -hmm. to advance a distorted view of history, right? Who have come at this not the way historians do, where we assess the evidence and then come to a conclusion. They've started with a conclusion and worked backwards to retrofit an argument and evidence to that. And so whether it's, the, you know, the Republican Party has never changed since the days of Lincoln or Reagan did nothing wrong or whatever, they start with that premise and they work backwards to advance uh, arguments which are simply deeply ahistorical. And so that's not revising the past, that's kind of negating it. Uh, and so we're up against something rather different today than we were even a generation ago. Do you? Th I sometimes think there's something else going on as well, and that is what I call the rise of the celebrity analyst. So you have these people like Dinesh D'Souza, like Bill Maher, like Dan Carlin with Hardcore History, although I don't think he's anywhere nearly as problematic as the first two I mentioned. And people seem to believe what they say as the gospel truth, even when professional historians say to them over dinner parties and social occasions, look, no, sorry, that's not just not right. Swimming up river against that is just very, very frustrating. Have either of you run into this problem in terms of just not, not, not your public facing stuff, but just your general conversations with friends and people and family and things like that? Have your Thanksgiving dinner conversations have been skewed by people ranting some Bill Maherism that isn't true? Yeah. Professor Zell. I mean, uh, yes, not so much in my family. I have a family with a lot of academics, so our conversations <laughs> tend to come right back there. But yeah, so as an example, I give talks a lot to different groups, and and I'll go around meeting people who are not in academia, very intelligent, well read, and it's not uncommon to hear arguments. I I pretty much know where the source is coming from. One of these celebrity analysts that you're talking about 
they hear it. You know, you, you hear, you read a review of a book and hear someone say something, write something. And very quickly, it can be absorbed as gospel, even by nonpartisan people or extremely partisan people, I must say. It, it's much broader than that in terms of how this stuff filters out. And they have enormous reach. Someone like Bill O'Reilly, you know, he publishes a book and it will be a bestseller. And he has a huge audience, even after kind of his fall from television. And it shouldn't be underestimated how some of those ideas can filter down very quickly. Because look, understandably, most people are not sitting around going to what the latest academic press has to say on the issue that mattered, or they don't remember their college courses, or they don't follow what their kids are learning in their classroom when they are at college. So they're busy. And so if you're on social media or you're watching television, certain voices are certainly going to be more pronounced and they make these claims about history. And there you go. It spreads. And so at the same time, I think part of it is kind of a political, familiar political battle, meaning uh, there is now a perception of historians as part of the coastal elite that is so derided mm -hmm. in much of the country. And so with that perception comes less willingness to turn to the professional historian in contrast to some of these people you'll see on television. And finally, look, some of it is ourselves. I mean, we can't just blame others. I do think sometimes historians haven't done enough. Not everyone wants to be in these roles, and I get why. But some of that translation, meaning not just of a historian going on air and saying, this is what happened, but historians who figure out to say, hey, look, we've had all this work on a given area that's relevant right now. This is what all that work has to say about the debate. And sometimes I think our, our profession doesn't or hasn't figured out how to do that very well. Uh, so all of this is at work and I think explains why the celebrity analyst slash sometimes historian very often has much more impact than any of us do individually or even collectively. Yeah, the, the Bill O'Reilly problem is, is really very, very serious. But Professor Cruz, one of the things I find, and I tend to, maybe it's just my own insecurity or my own bristling at this phenomenon, is that people will, when you say something as a professional historian and an expert on something, people will push back against you in ways that they wouldn't push back against a, if a medical doctor says your leg is broken, people don't say, well, Bill O'Reilly thinks it, blah, blah, blah. If I say the thing about Jimmy Stewart having PTSD is based on no evidence, people actually get offended. In the, and it, it's as almost as if history has the, is this special lack of credibility now that people will, won't, won't question a physicist or an astronomer or, or a biologist. But if a history professor says something, there's no evidence for mm -hmm. something, a lot of times people just lose yeah. their minds as if it's a it's a personal yeah. insult. Well, now, I'm sure the, uh, there are probably doctors uh, listening to this, uh, medical doctors who are uh, thinking, you know, people are screaming at Fauci right now. So uh, even they are... Well, that, even, that's, even that's, sorry, that's a bad example. And there's, just the, there's of course, the, the Gwyneth right, Paltrow yeah, problem, yeah. too. Um, yeah. But I think you're right. I, I do think there's become a... Uh, and this is... I mean, this speaks to both the the power of history, but also the apparent simplicity of it, right? Everyone feels invested mm -hmm. in this project, especially in American history. They feel like they've gotten some own kind of personal training, whether it's even just, you know, elementary school and high school and college courses. People have some sense of this, whether it's history in the public sphere or national celebrations or just a general sense of nationalism. They have some vague idea about this, but often that vague idea is very fervently believed, right? And so it's tough to it's tough for us to shake them out of that belief because in a sense, they kind of feel in their bones if they, they know, oh, America is not an empire or, oh, the Civil War was about uh, economics or whatever thing that they've heard time and time again, it's hard for us to shake it. And I think Julian's point that historians have increasingly been regarded as some kind of out of touch elite, like we're all hatched in, you know, some lab in Harvard Yard has really taken hold. But I think, again, it speaks to the power of what we're talking about and how important these issues are, that people aren't casting off their deeply held belief at the slightest pushback. It shows how much work we've got to do. But it's almost as if, again, history is this special case where it's you're pushing against against a religious type of belief rather than if you say, look, gravity right. exists and, and people will buy it. Something about history seems to me to be fragile in, the, in our culture in that way. And that's, uh, the, well, histori historians have uh, have to 
have to well, again, I, I think it's 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 especially clear in, in American history and especially in, well, I was going to say 20th century history, but the founder's history speeches, speaks to this too. It's really personally felt, right? We think of these histories as yeah. national histories, but often these national identities are, are really uh, taken personally uh, by, by people for whom patriotism is an extension of their personality, right? And so any perceived slight on uh, the nation and, and often when historians are pointing out that things are messier and dirtier than they uh, you might have been led to believe in an elementary school where everybody got along and everyone was happy. When we point that out, we're seen as kind of raining on the parade. And it's not just mm. the national identity that takes a hit, it's their personal identity because they're invested in this. And, and, and I get that. And it, it shows, again, why we have to tread carefully, but also why this work is, is so vital. Well, it's a good time for us to take a little sponsorship break. So we'll do that now. And we'll come back with Dr. Cruz and Dr. Zelizer to talk about their specific chapters in this very, very, very important book. So back in a minute. Okay, we're back, Buzzkillers, with Dr. Cruz, Dr. Kevin Cruz, and Dr. Julian Zelizer, both from Princeton, who are the editors of this great new book, Myth America, Historians Take on the Biggest Legends and Lies About Our Past. Now, before we went to break, professors, we talked about the general nature of the book. And before we talk about your specific chapters, I'd like to address this one question that you bring up in the introduction, and that is you have deliberately avoided discussing myths about slavery in this book. Why is that, Dr. Zelizer? It wasn't avoided. It's just in a book like this, we were already way over in terms of what we were supposed to have and what we had. There were many topics and authors that we just couldn't fit. And one area that has received so much attention already, in part because of the 1619 Project, but also just because of the politics of the moment, is the role of slavery, the long-term impact of slavery. You know, one of our authors at the beginning, Akhil Amar, does have a little bit to say from his perspective on this matter. But we basically chose to leave that one out since it's already out there. And there'll be other works, I'm sure, that continue to deal with this so that we can start to tackle some other questions that haven't received the same amount of attention uh, recently. And that that was really the decision there. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't have said avoided, because of course, slavery as an issue runs through an awful lot of these chapters. But Professor Cruz, I I think one of the the good things about that is you're able to devote chapters to some very, very interesting things that are, I think, are completely overlooked, as we'll find out when Professor Petrozella comes on later in the month. Family values, mm-hmm. feminism might not have made the cut yeah. in a, a book that was overwhelmed with the, probably the biggest issue in American mm-hmm. history. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And and as, as Julian said, it wasn't that we felt the issue wasn't important, far from it. It's more that we, the 1619 Project, and I'm a contributor there, uh, we should note, has a number of historians who've written for the edited collection who have said sort of what we would have said in this volume. So uh, we didn't want to be redundant, given that there were so many things uh, that we we simply couldn't get to. We, we just wanted to devote space to, to things that hadn't gotten attention before. Well, that's a good, very good segue into your chapter, Dr. Cruz, about the Southern strategy, which, of course, is a, is a, lot, a lot about race. And this is something that, of course, I thought I knew about, taught it for years and years and years. And it turns out that it's much, much, much longer in chronology and much deeper and problematic than I had originally thought. So please tell us, well, first of all, let's give the buzz killers an encapsulation of what the standard story, the standard received version of the story of what the Southern strategy was. So the standard received story, and this is, I think, maybe a good illustration of one of the problems we have with this book, is in many ways, we're replicating things that are widely understood in the profession, but maybe not said as clearly and as concisely as we needed. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the inspiration for this came from people on Twitter who denied there ever had been a Southern strategy. And these are our logic, I think, Republican activists who are trying to deny the presence of racism in the party today by pretending it had never been racist before. Again, this cuts against decades of not just perceived wisdom in the profession, but Republican strategists and chairman of the Republican National Committee have apologized for this Southern strategy. So the traditional view has been that this is simply in the 60s, usually rooted around Richard Nixon, maybe Barry Goldwater. In the 60s, the Republican Party suddenly decided that its only way to win over white Southerners was to appeal to them on issues of segregation and civil rights and and the resentment over those changes. That They had long been in the Democratic Party, but as the Democratic Party turned to civil rights under Kennedy and Johnson, these 
white Southern conservatives were alienated and retreated from the sphere. And again, this is something that's been in the background. We've all known about this. But what I found out, again, through my engagement on Twitter, was that as I would try to walk people through this history, and I would do so with, you know, with primary sources, with evidence, I kept wanting to point people to a good book on this. And there are great books that cover this. The problem is they're all, you know, like 800 page tomes yeah, of yeah. political science. They really are deeply in the weeds. And I didn't, I couldn't find just a single short essay on this. So like any teacher who wants to assign something that's not been written, I decided I had to write it myself. Mm -hmm. So that was the impetus for, in fact, that was the, the for me, the opening point of this volume was thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. Who else can we get to do these sort of things? So again, I went into this and, and wrote this, but like you discovered that I thought I knew the full story, but it was even more interesting and more complicated than I'd previously assumed. So it was a, it was an education for me too. So how far back can we say that this Southern strategy as a, as a modern 20th century development, when did it sort of start? Well, if we think about the Southern strategy as the intentional recruitment of by Republicans of disaffected Southern Democrats, which is kind of a loose definition I think mm -hmm. we, can, we can agree on. You could say it starts in the 30s. There are efforts by Republicans to reach out to Southern Democrats who are back in power because of the New Deal, but feeling increasingly crowded out by an administration that is starting to take uh, non-white members into the coalition. But it really comes into crystal clear, for me at least, relief after the Dixiecrat Rebellion. The, the Dixiecrats uh, under Strom Thurmond bolt when uh, Harry Truman's party embraces civil rights in 1948. They wage an independent campaign. It fails largely, uh, and when they fold themselves back into the Democratic fold. And that's typically seen as kind of an early aberration, but things aren't don't really break down until the late 60s. But what I found is by looking at what Republicans do in this period, they're actively courting these, these Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. John Bricker, Ohio Senator, 1944, vice presidential candidate, in 1949 is talking about, we've got to have some sort of, you know, realignment here that brings together conservative Republicans and conservative Dixiecrats. The chairman of the Republican National Committee, Guy Gabrielson, goes down to Alabama in 1952 and says, Look, Republicans believe in states' rights. Dixiecrats believe in states' rights. We should get together and you should vote for us. Other prominent figures, Carl Munt, who's a, ma a major ally of Joe McCarthy, an outspoken conservative, is debating with a liberal Republican in the pages of, uh, of Collier's magazine. Should the GOP merge with the Dixiecrats is the question. He gives a resounding yes. Hmm. He says the parties have already changed and it's only a matter of time. So as early as 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, Republicans are actively out there courting the Dixiecrats. We often think that this doesn't come into relief and, and kind of a full-throated Southern strategy until, say, 62, 64, when, when people are really pinning this on Goldwater. But it's there a decade earlier, and, and it's really uh, underway. And so we start to see the, the ground starting to shift there. It doesn't really come into clear focus until Goldwater in 64, but it's, it's underway at least a decade and a half earlier. So we're, we're using words like flip, and that the parties completely change almost sound like that you know makes it too uh too sharp yeah. to, 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 you're turning on a dime this didn't happen yeah that, and that's an excellent point is, is when i run into people who, who say oh there was oh did the parties just suddenly change their minds one year no it, it wasn't an abrupt change it comes in a real relief around the 1964 election but it's a process that had been underway from the new deal and isn't completed until really the 90s right it, it's there's a trickle down phenomenon uh, the two political scientists at south carolina have called this a trickle down realignment mm -hmm. it takes a long time changes at the presidential level come first but those loyalties at a state and local level where you know your local democratic congressman from south carolina isn't like those northern Kennedys and mm. isn't like those liberals. He's different. He's a South Carolina Democrat. He's a Georgia Democrat, whatever. There's a sense of, that that local party is more aligned and people are more reluctant to give up those ties, but but they come. And so this process takes place over decades. It's it, as, I, as I write in the piece, it's, it's a glacial change in both senses of the word. It takes a long time, but it thoroughly transforms the landscape it leaves behind. And another one of the things that your chapter taught me was, you know, I had always thought more or less that the Goldwater campaign in 64 and Goldwater's sort of career was all about libertarianism and removing the government from, you know, all about this you know, hyper free market 
econ economics, but there's an awful lot of race baiting, mm -hmm. appealing to segregationists uh, in the Goldwater campaign that, that I hadn't known about before. So the, sort of the culmination of the Southern strategy in 64, you, you, people might have dismissed it because Goldwater was just running on economic terms. It turns out to be not true either. That's correct, yeah. And, and we should know Goldwater himself, I, I don't think, was a racist. Mm -hmm. He writes in Conscience of the Conservative that it's just and good for uh, Negro children and white children to go to the same schools. But, a huge but here, he says the federal government shouldn't have the power to force it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, for Southern segregationist. The distinctions between those lines don't matter right, at all. Right, right. Simply, Goldwater is against the Civil Rights Act, has voted against it. Lyndon Johnson, the Democratic standard bearer, has pushed for it and has brought Hubert Humphrey, the party's point man on civil rights, in as his VP candidate. So in 64, there's a stark relief. The Republicans are all Southern strategy. The Democrats are all civil rights. And that really brings it into relief. But Goldwater had for years been laying the groundwork for this. He, he would pr pretend that this is simply a libertarian stance, but when he's out campaigning in South Carolina, praising Strom Thurmond in the late 1950s, when he goes on the White Citizens Council's uh, radio show in 1959, praising segregationists, dismissing and downplaying the Brown decision, calling the act of the Supreme Court illegitimate, he knows what he is doing. He knows that this is a way to win over the votes of Southern segregationists, who he knows are conservative on other issues. They're conservative on foreign policy and national defense. They're mm -hmm. conservative on thinking about the government. They're conservative about labor issues. They're conservative about taxes. It's just this one issue of segregation has kept them in the Democratic stable. Well, if you can show them that that's not an issue anymore, they don't have to worry about that with a Republican, they'll come on board. And Goldwater sees this early and is really a prophet of the Southern strategy, but by no means the only one. Well, Professor Zellinger, you, you're... Reagan Revolution chapter, the next to last chapter in the book, it was also one of these things that completely changed my mind about what happened in the in the 80s. And if I was still teaching American history, I, I would have to revise my that, that section of my course almost completely. And as you rightly point out, the term Reagan Revolution has become one of these slogans, one of these sort of things that, that is almost, you know, you can't criticize it or approach it or say that there's any evidentiary problems with that concept it's almost as if it's biblical truth or one of the one of the 10 commandments or one of the first 10 amendments in the bill of rights it's it's, a, it's an amazing sort of you know iconic thing that just sticks with us and then as you show it's almost completely not true yeah i mean it's a very powerful idea it really initially was promoted by reagan administration officials themselves uh, early in the administration for the idea of creating a mandate and it's shaped how we think of the 1980s where 1980 and the election really is a decisive shift conservatism is triumphant in this country and the 1960s and the 1930s are essentially rejected uh, at that moment and that american politics has moved forward through today and t even today the term is important not just as an interpretation of history but it's really used often to undermine persistent popularity and hold uh, that liberalism had long after the 1980s uh, right through today. Mm -hmm. And so challenging something like the Reagan revolution, the concept that there was a revolution, that that really defines what the decade was about, extraordinarily difficult. I mean, there's very few political figures like Ronald Reagan in modern times who have so come to define a decade like him. Uh, and so that's part of what an essay like this and, and other kinds of work on the period are trying to go after. One of the things you show so clearly is that the public opinion polls about Reagan and his approval ratings or whatever are remarkably low, especially compared to the people who are thought to have been failures, the, the, the Carters, the, the Nixons, the Carters, the Fords. I was, again, very surprised by this. Yeah, I was too. And that was kind of one area I looked a lot for this particular essay. So, so it started to come out. I mean, look, I am a historian who often focuses on Congress. Mm -hmm. And so if you study Capitol Hill uh, in the 1980s, uh, there's a lot of important developments in conservatism taking place. I wrote a book on Newt Gingrich coming to power, for example. But liberals still really rule the roost. And Democrats as a party rule the roost in the House of Representatives, for example, where 
Speaker Tip O'Neill is extraordinarily powerful. Where Ronald Reagan is not a love president all over the country. He's incredibly divisive. I mean, really divisive. He represents something that many Democrats believe is a fundamental mistake in terms of the direction the country is taking. And then you look at public opinion and say, well, where where's the nation? And, and you find similar results. There's moments Reagan's approval ratings are extraordinarily low, including after the Iran, Iran-Contra scandal, where they fall, a deeper fall than any president had suffered since Gallup started tracking that. And throughout the presidency on issue after issue, like when Reagan tries to cut Social Security benefits in 1981, the public isn't where the conservative revolution is. So the public opinion is striking. Conditions in Capitol Hill are often discordant with what Reagan is arguing for. And it certainly doesn't look like a revolution from either perspective. It doesn't mean Reagan is not significant. It doesn't mean Mm -hmm. conservatism is not an extraordinarily powerful movement. But it's not as if everything starts anew in January of 1981. And it's not if these institutions and ideas that had building for a decade just go away with the snap of a finger. And they play a big role in American politics in that decade and in decades leading up through today. Yeah, it's accepted as a, just an absolute fact. Now, I'm thinking again of the celebrity analysts, the Joe Scarboroughs, the John Meachams, uh, who, granted, uh, probably not a celebrity analyst, but certainly a journalistic historian rather than an academic historian. You know, they treat this as stone cold fact and, and unassailable. And it's just amazing to me. Professor, can we add, can we address this one little myth that I think is important, but I, it's a little myth, but I think it's important for this subject. And that is the idea that Reagan and Tip O'Neill used to, after going at it hammer and tongs during the day in Congress, whatever, would 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 meet up for a beer at night and and, and swap war stories and, and funny things. Is there any truth to that at all? I mean, it's it, it's one of the stories you hear over and over. And it really, if you read O'Neill's memoir, you wouldn't see that beer drinking part of no. the story there. Because he describes Reagan as really just a terrible president who was doing bad things, whose policies were really just detrimental to all the constituents he cared about. It's not simply a political criticism. <laughs> I mean, and this is, I can't remember what year the memoir came out, but he's writing with a level of antipathy that is, you know, anything but the image that you just described. So it's subtle, meaning I don't want to say that things haven't changed since the 1980s. I do think there's a deterioration of relationships in Washington, for example, right, and the right, level right, of right. discord is much worse. It's like you literally don't want to walk in the room with someone anymore, yeah. which is different than an era where governing was still prioritized. And uh, Tip O'Neill certainly would get together with many Republicans and at least negotiate. That said, it totally downplays the level of tension that that Reagan presidency caused in the country and the level of friction it generated for someone like Tip O'Neill and his successor, Speaker Jim Wright, who also really disliked Reagan at a personal level, not just kind of in abstract political debate. So I really don't think that is kind of an appropriate description of, of what life was like in Washington then. Yes, but it's in it's it's fixed firmly in the American consciousness. Yeah. Well, professors, I just can't imagine a better show than this one. I'm sure we've done we've done great we've done great shows in the past, including yours, Doctor Zelizer, on Newt Gingrich uh, a couple of years ago. And so, before we go, please let's have a couple of one-liners from each of you about why people should get this book. Doctor Cruz, you first. Uh, I think the book is is first and most, as Julian said, it's a good read. I think mm-hmm. we're all really proud of the the work we've done in in here. But it's also, I think, something that people find really useful. Um, yes. uh, again, our, our targets here aren't the people who are spreading these myths, but rather people who are on the sidelines and are hearing these myths and wondering, is that true? Well, here you go. Mm. Uh, you've got the, the answers at your fingertips. Dr. Zelzer. And these are pretty foundational issues, all of the chapters, things you talk about, things you read about. And if you follow the news and are interested at all in public debates, your essays, the essays here are really going to just open up your knowledge of what we actually know about these issues in very well-written, easy to read, kind of fast moving pieces. So I think it's enjoyable at that level. And then it just leaves you much more informed next time you're having a conversation with someone about lots of stuff that you hear in the news all the time. Yes, they are easy to read, but they're also very deep in terms of the 
of, yeah. of the research and then the backing up with evidence. And then I'll just add, I mean, that was really important. We, we really picked historians who are serious historians who have done amazing work over long careers often. And we wanted kind of that sweet spot of mm. short and fast moving essays, but are co totally rooted in scholarship and people who are bringing together scholarship effectively was really what we were hoping to achieve. And we think we have. Oh, you've absolutely achieved it. And we should tell, tell the buzz close, you know, there are 20 chapters in this book. Most edited volumes have 10 or a dozen. This has 20 and they're, and they're all excellent. I've read the book a few times now. I have it in sort of advanced format from the, from the publisher. We should remind the buzz killers that it is available on the buzzkill bookshelf. One of our lucky, lucky Patreon listeners will be getting a free copy. And of course they'll should look for their email look at their email for that contest coming up soon. Please go to ProfessorBuzzkill.com for all the shows and all the fun. And it just remains for me to thank Dr. Kevin Cruz for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having us. Dr. Julian Zelzer for coming on the show again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Buzzkillers, as you know, we're devoting the entire month of January to this book. So please tune in next week. Next week.